Hello everybody, this is Dr. Christopher White and in the final part of this presentation we're going to take a bit of time just to think about what the Earth's internal structure actually means for us in a day-to-day -day kind of way. Now before we go any further, we are just going to note down the code word for today's presentation. The code word is PUG, P-U-G, like the dog, PUG. So make sure you note that down, put it somewhere safe because you're going to need it for the code word quiz. All right, so the Earth's internal layering. So the presence of this uh, condu conductive uh, iron nickel alloy, which is convecting in the outer core, is extremely helpful to us because the convection of this iron nickel alloy will produce electric currents. And these electric currents will interact with the Earth's natural, rather weak magnetic field, and it will produce a secondary much larger magnetic field. So the Earth's magnetic field is not only useful for navigation but it protects us from the Sun's solar wind and it does this by producing the magnetosphere. So the solar wind is just a, it's a constant stream of charged particles that comes flying off the Sun in all directions and it's non-stop. Now, if we didn't have the magnetosphere, this constant stream of particles would just be smashing into our atmosphere all the time. And it would slowly begin to degrade away our atmosphere, and we would lose the ozone layer initially, so we would lose you know, ultraviolet light protection. And then over time, it would slowly but surely begin to degrade our atmosphere, and then we would lose the ability to breathe. So its presence is extremely, extremely helpful. It also offers us additional protection. So every once in a while, the sun will fire off just a mass of material off its surface in the form of a solar flare or a coronal mass ejection. And essentially, this is just this big ball of you know charged particles that comes flying in whichever direction it goes. And you know, if we're unfortunate unfortunate enough to be in the path of that projectile, it could do us quite a lot of damage. But luckily, we have the magnetosphere. So as the solar flare or coronal mass ejection comes flying our way, it simply gets deflected around the planet. Now, this is amazingly helpful because if we didn't have the uh, magnetos uh, magnetosphere in this instance, number one, the solar flare would strike satellites and that would cause the satellites to short circuit. And obviously that would mean that we would lose you know, internet communication, cell phone communication, GPS, etc. And so that would be you know, a major, major issue. But also, if a solar flare or a coronal mass ejection made it to the surface of the Earth unchecked, it would bring with it huge amounts of radiation. So beta radiation, alpha radiation, and you know, some other fun stuff that, I'm not, that, that I don't even know about. And so it would probably be amazingly damaging. And so the presence of the magnetosphere protecting the Earth has essentially allowed life to establish itself on Earth and to thrive. So it's been extraordinarily important in evolution. So is, does the internal layering of the Earth do anything else interesting? Well, yes, it does. So have you ever wondered why precious metals are so rare? Now, when we look at the periodic table, what we can do is we can actually split up the elements based on what they like to form bonds with. So this particular classification is called the Goldschmidt classification, and it splits elements into four main groups, the lithophile elements, the citrophile elements, the charcophile elements, and the atomophile elements. <clears throat> Excuse me there. So the lithophile elements are elements that like to form Essentially, well, they're referred to as the rock-loving elements, and they like to form bonds with things like oxygen and silicon and aluminum. So, oxygen in particular. The sigophile elements are referred to as the iron-loving elements, and they like to form bonds with iron. The charcophile elements, also sometimes called the chalcophile elements, uh, like to form bonds with the uh, charcogenide elements, that's sulfur, selenium, tellurium. And then we have the atomophile elements. Those are elements or called the gas-loving elements, and they occur as gases at atmospheric pressures. So those are your noble gases, things like helium, neon, uh, xenon, those kind of gases. 
So if we look at the periodic table, here we go. You can see we have lift file elements in orange, citra file elements in pinky purple, chalk file elements in yellow, and the atma file elements here in blue. Now, when we so when we went and formed the emissible iron liquid in the magma, it actually had a pretty serious effect. So if we just go back for a second and look at the periodic table, these are the iron-loving elements. Remember, we had an iron liquid floating around in our magma ocean in very, very large amounts. And it just so happens that we have a whole range of elements which are attracted to and want to form bonds with iron. That includes things like molybdenum, manganese, cobalt, nickel, oh, ruthenium, rhodium, palladium, rhenium, osmium, iridium, platinum, gold. And so all of a sudden, we can begin to see where all these precious elements have ended up, haven't they? They've been vacuumed up by these iron liquid droplets in the magma ocean, and then they've been taken down to the Earth's core, where they've been sequestered, and we're never going to get at them again. And so if we look here, we can see this, uh, this yellow area marks out the, some of the elements which are you know, very likely to form uh, citrophile bonds, and these are the rarest metals. And it's only tellurium, which is really the only uh, bit of an anomaly there. Everything else, you know, uh, ruthenium, rhodium, palladium, rhenium, osmium, iridium, platinum, and gold, you know, were all the ones we were just talking about a second ago. So, you know, this is rather interesting. On, on another note, though, if you remember, we were discussing elements which were not preferentially sequestered during the formation of the mantle or the core. Now these include elements such as uh, sodium, aluminum, silicon, magnesium, potassium, calcium. So what we have here is we have a whole group of elements which were not used to make the mantle or the core and they steadily became more and more concentrated in the residual liquid magma. Well, in the residual liquid magma, in the residual magma. And so what we have here is we have the elements which are most common in the crust. And so these elements which were left behind and weren't used to make the mantle, those are the ones that help to make the oceanic and the continental crust. So, you know, this is, you know, how, how this works is essentially due to a, a process called... Uh, incompatibility so essentially you know is a metal compatible or incompatible with a certain thing so in the case of a, uh, a silicate magma and iron iron liquid if we put platinum nearby the platinum would be compatible with the iron liquid but incompatible with the silicate magma so <clears throat> We measure this in the form of partition coefficients. That tells us, it gives us a number to tell us just how strongly that platinum would want to go into the iron liquid versus the silicate magma. And the partition coefficient is given the abbreviation D. And so if we look at some partition coefficients, so this is between a iron liquid and a silicate magma. And so if we look at the partition coefficients for palladium, gold, iridium, and platinum, we can see. So for platinum, it's 16 million. For gold, it's 25 million. For iridium, it's quite a large number. And for platinum, it's just getting plain silly. So what this means is that for every one atom of gold in the silicate magma, you would expect to find 25 million atoms of gold within the iron liquid. And so it's not really unsurprising then that these elements were vacuumed up so efficiently by the iron liquid and sequestered down in the core, never ever to be available to us again. So when it really comes down to us, it, when it comes down to it, it's uh, geologists who are to blame for frightening jewelry prices, and we do apologise for that. All right, everybody. So that's where we're going to stop today. So once again, uh, thank you for sticking with me. I hope you found the presentation okay. Take care and I'll see you soon.